we have uh, looked at Hebrews 11 in a general way. We haven't studied every verse about it, but we try to take you a, across the book, the 11th chapter to try to show you how the writer is writing it. And um, <clears throat> what we noticed is that he divided it uh, as far as people, into four groups. He put them in verses 4 through 7, he put them in, he put them in the antediluvian period. Uh, that's before the flood. <clears throat> like he put Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Uh, I don't know if he put anybody else. I think just three. And then in 8 through 22, he did the patriarch period. He went from Abraham and Sarah to Isaac to Jacob. And then instead of going to Judah, which would be the normal link, he went to Joseph, uh, which was kind of interesting. And then he went in the Jewish age. The, he, he just lumped the whole thing into the Jewish period. He went from uh, 23 through 38. Our, our verse comes from that section. And then the fourth group, is the church period, and that's verse 30, uh, 39 and 40. So he did something really interesting in the way he divided this up, talking about the faith cycle. Now, a lot of people look at Hebrews 11.1 1 as a definition of faith, and it's actually a definition of the mechanics of it. But the other thing he did that I thought was really interesting once you see the groupings, once, once you get a look at how he grouped, then you go back and you look at it. And what he did is he put a doctrinal principle to the faith cycle in every one of the groups. And, of course, that really intrigued me because the subject of Hebrews 11 is faith, the faith cycle. And so we have... We have been doing a study on the doctrines out of each group that was singled out. For example, in uh, the antediluvian period, we have Hebrews 11.6, which is a very famous quote. <clears throat> a lot of times it's not taken in the context of the greater picture, and so we miss a lot uh, in it. And then uh, in the uh, patriarch period, he did a verse, he did a longer section. He did the 11th chapter, verses 13 through 16. He, he dealt, developed a doctrinal principle there. And then in our Jewish age, he pulled out one, that's verse 38. And then in verse 39 and 40, you'll see there's one in 40. So I find that really, really of great interest because what it says is that the faith cycle, the, the, the mechanics of faith in the Christian life has been a key to every group of old covenant believers and is the same for the new covenant believers. We, we walk by faith and not by sight. I, that's Paul's opinion. So, we have been looking at the doctrinal principles, and we're in the third group. We're in the Jewish group, the third group, and we're at the doctrinal principle that's outlined in verse 38. Now, in 2 Peter 3.16, you're going to need that verse tonight because Peter reminds you that when you study Paul, Paul sometimes gets a little technical, and you're going to have to have your what cap on? you got to have your thinking cap on. You're going to have to really pay attention because in this verse, verse 38, which is the third doctrinal principle laid out, it gets a little technical. It gets a little technical in, in the Greek grammar. It's only one verse, but it's kind of loaded. <laughs> and sometimes they are like that. And so we're going to look tonight. In, look at verse 38 for a moment in your Bibles with me. Notice it begins with a parenthesis. Does your Bible have a parenthesis? Mm -hmm. It should in 1138. 
It should have a parenthesis. It may, your Bible may not have one, but because it, it, it is a parenthesis, and so the English writers, they've showed it to you because somebody may not explain to you uh, how that was developed. But the first part of that verse, men of whom the world was not worthy, is a parenthesis. It's, it's a parenthesis clause. Okay, that's very important. Men of whom the world was not worthy. That's where my title came from, from that parenthesis. It's, a, it's what we call a parenthetical clause. And it's, the, the biggest point here is not the word men. The, in fact, the word men is not even in the original text. But what is of importance is the word whom. The word whom is really important. You will see tonight that it's the Greek word has, which is a relative pronoun. It's ablative, plural, masculine, ablative. It is the ablative of this, of what's called ablative in comparison, that brings us to a parenthetical clause. Now, what, what you have to remember about this is that we're in a section, now this is important, we're in a section that goes from Hebrews 11, 23 through 38. That's the Jewish period. Now, sometimes we forget that. This is the last verse of that section. We're talking about the Jewish period. Well, just drop up there for a moment and look at verse 23, just a moment. Then we'll have a word of prayer. See, that's where that period starts. No, see, it gives a list of people. See that list of people? They're judges and prophets listed. If you know anything about those people. Judges and prophets. Then he gets in a discussion about undeserved suffering through this whole chapter. He's going to go through a whole series. And the way this is divided in the Greek language is just phenomenal. And we're going to discuss that tonight. But we're going to pay attention to the idea of men of whom the world was not worthy. Men of whom. Now the word men is not there. And for good reason. Which I'll explain tonight. But he is referring to old, old covenant believers who paid an ultimate price for their faith in Christ. I mean, they were persecuted unbelievable. And he goes through just a lot of listing of what they went through, not necessarily who, but what. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study today to try to show you what the writer is trying to point out. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. We can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, overt sins. How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to teach and recall to my life pertinence of the Bible? Confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, God is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. It is that cleansing that works in the Christian life from the work of Christ on the cross regarding personal sin. And it puts me back into spirituality ministry, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. I give you a moment, both those who are in our study tonight and those who are attending by internet we would request it from you as well. Now, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God tonight about the faith cycle, how it worked in different periods 
of biblical history in the lives of people, and especially the old covenant people, looking at them all the way from the beginning uh, with the Abel moving all the way down to the church age. And faith has been the common denominator. Walk by faith and not by sight has been a principle of understanding. And the writer in the book of Hebrews went into chapter 11 and really dealt with it. And he talks about the importance of faith in each section at different periods of their life and what they were going through. The antediluvian world was under the judgment, divine judgment of God to destroy a world because of ungodliness. Each section, Father, like that has a key element. And faith is necessary to walk it out in that dispensational situation or that period of their life in which faith is the key. In this period, it's undeserved suffering. It's being persecuted for the cause of Christ. And we need to see that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to, I want you to take a look. I want you to take a look. I want you to take a look at Hebrews 11:38, and I want to show you three things about it that's really important. I want you to see how important this is going to be. The first one is that this parenthesis clause, parenthetical clause, is really important to understand it. The word men is not there in the original text. It begins with the word whom, which is hos. It's a relative pronoun. It's ablative, ablative of comparison. And the writer has stopped in verse 38 or, or has concluded in 38 what he's been talking about, about this period of Jewish history that he began a discussion in in 23. Are you with me? 23 through 38. So it's important that we connect what we're talking about here. We, we started this discussion in verse 23 in the Jewish period. And now in verse 32, and so we've gone from 23 to 31. Now we're in a technical place. In verse 32, if you'll notice, from 32 to 38, we are in all different manners of being persecuted for Christ. Do you see that? Look at all the different ways that people during that period of, of biblical history were being persecuted for Christ. It's unbelievable. Uh, for example, they were being sawn in half. Many believe it's a reference to Jeremiah. and the, All these people have identities. But listen, he doesn't, he's, when he gets to 32, he's not talking about people now. He's talking about what in general the old covenant believers, those who were living their life for Christ out in the public arena, what they were suffering for, for their faith. You know, the world doesn't punish you if your faith is in a closet. It, it punishes you when it's out in the public arena. And this is what they were being persecuted for, for, for identifying their life publicly with Jesus Christ. And when you get to verse 32, I mean, it takes your breath away when you see what these people went through, both men and women, what they went through. But in this original clause, parenthetical clause, men of whom the world... The word ho was the definite article in cosmos, not as singular masculine, which makes that the subject. Was, I mean, which is an imperfect tense, which looking at this entire period and what's going on consistently in it. This Jewish period that began with the judges, he picked up at the period of the judges and went to the prophets. Now, the prophets is the key place that he's after. Because the people are being persecuted, the people who are sitting under the prophets, who are believing the, the word of God and living the life of Christ publicly, not privately, but publicly, not in a closet, 
but out in the street of the public affairs was being persecuted unbelievable. Okay? And so the imperfect tense, the idea of keeping on, it's keeping on. The world kept on. Now, it says the world was not. Ook is a strong negative. Worthy. Notice that worthy, watch this now, worthy is a predicate adjective. Notice, notice that it's a nominative singular masculine identified with the world. Now that should stun you. Men of whom the world was not worthy. When I read that, that stunned me. That I would find that declared that way. And I'll tell you what I worked out through it. Here's the second thing in this text that's important. In verse 32, if you look up to verse 32 in your Bible, look at verse 32. See the word. Well, in verse 32, you're going to see a list of people. In verse 38, we have the word whom. See the word whom? It's Haas. Do you see that? In verse 32, he gives a list of people. He gives a, he gives a list of judges, and he talks about the prophets as a plural group. Now look at verse 33 and 34. Look at verse 33. See the word who? That's hoss. I can't tell you how important that is. That's hoss. That's a relative pronoun, nominative plural masculine. That's a relative pronoun, just like the whom. Just like whom. Who. And here's what you have in verse 32, you have a group of people identified. In verse 33, you're going to find that group of people is under discussion from verses 33 through 38. You got a who's who group. You know who's who? This is the who's who group. You got to see that because that's important. He put a relative pronoun at the beginning of this suffering, and he put it at the end of the Jewish age. Are you with me? That's the who's who's of suffering. He, and he gave a little bit of group just to get it started. Then he goes into what they suffered. So what you have in verse 33, which begins now, a start of a sequence of what they were going, what they were being persecuted for, right? And you can read that and see that. You can see that. But what you may not know is you don't pay attention to things like a relative pronoun that starts it and ends it, right? It starts it and ends it. That's really important because what it shows is just a sequence of persecutions in that. What's interesting also is verse 35. In the midst of all this, where we got the who's to the who, we see we got a who's on the front side at verse 34, we got a who's that closes it in 38, and then we got a sequence of what the, the, the who's who's went through. Are you with me? I told you you had to what hat cap? You got to have a what hat on? All right. There's not time to sleep on me. All right. In verse 35, we've got women. In the Greek, it's gune. G-U-N-E. Somewhere I have it. Oh, I have it there. Uh, now I'm in the plural masculine. So we know now that men, that's not even in the original text, doesn't mean men in the literal sense, does it? <laughs> because he introduced the women in the suffering as well. So what he's done is identified Old Covenant believers in the Jewish period, especially in the period of the prophets, both men and women who identified their life with Christ publicly were being persecuted equally. So that changes the idea of men. If you're going to use the word men there that's not in the original text, 
you've certainly got to be inclusive of men and women, right? Because he doesn't permit it any other way. So verse 35 is very important to where we're going. Now here's another one. In verse 36 and 37, he introduces another group. All right? We have some people listed in 32. We start to who's who's. We're introduced to women to be sure that women were not excluded from it. They were paying a heavy price for their identity in Christ. And then verse 36 and 37, see the word others? That's heteros. Different. Hetero, alas is the same kind. Heteros is different kinds. So when you get to verse 36, heteros and others experienced mocking and scourging. Others. 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 Yeah. We had in verse 35, up in 32, we got men. In 35, we got women. Now we got other others that are not adult men and adult women. Now what we got? What's left? Children. Children. In other words, those who haven't reached adult. Now, adult, right? You understand that. Do you not have people in your family that are considered young people who do not mind living their faith out in the public? Huh? We've got young people in this church and college that are living their life out publicly for Christ. Uh, Christianity has a lot of them. We just recently saw a young couple going to southern Mississippi uh, for Campus Crusade called Cruz that is trying to mobilize young people for Christ on college campuses. We, you know, we got Cassidy down at Auburn. We got, we got the Nap boy. We got Josh at UAB, and we got others. This is others. Heteros. Other people. Others. Now, here's the third thing. So, see, you're, you're, you're really looking at something really interesting here. I mean, you just go through it, and your mind kind of goes numb when you go through all these different persecutions. You don't pay attention to some little key things that interrupts it. I mean, we're not talking about just men who are out there preaching and doing that kind of stuff, women and young people, they're being persecuted because they're going public with their faith for Christ. I mean, where, what, what, what other way would you go with your faith in Christ but public? I mean, how can you not? You are who you are. I mean, you are who you are. And you're a child of God. You're an ambassador for Christ. How could you not be this? When he prayed the supreme Christ, Christ paid the supreme price to put that title on you. Son of God. Follower of Christ. We're talking about some people in the old covenant that took all that serious, believe it or not. Just like people today. I'm really impressed with young people today. The last three years at our senior camp, the, the academy kids that I've been dealing with, if, if you had any doubt that we don't have, that Christian kids are not stepping up to the plate for Christ. And listen, there's some, there's some good teaching on going out there other than our church. Because I'm seeing a lot of young people on fire for God that are stable. Uh, and we get a chance to meet a lot of them who come to our camp and work with us. Now, the third thing I want to point out to you is back to verse 38. 
we got to who in verse 38 who starts the sequence of suffering and we have the whom which is the hoss to close the sequence I find that to be really important there's one other thing this parenthesis now you don't miss this put your hat on Notice the parentheses broke the sequence of suffering. That's why it's a parenthesis. Now, look, look, run your eyes down the list. Did, did he not do that? Absolutely he did that. Absolutely he did that. So you would miss that if he didn't pay attention. That's a big deal. He broke the sequence, and that became a, a, a parenthetical clause. Are you with me? Now, you see it broke. He broke it, did he? That's a parenthetic, parenthetical clause. I'm going to talk about it. Stay, stay with me. Don't get ahead of me. Stay with me. Now, watch the last ones. Watch the last ones. The key word is wandering nomadically. I mean, homeless. Listen, the church of Jesus Christ became homeless. Wandering. They are, they are homeless. That's what we would call it today in America, homeless. But they're homeless for Christ, not because they made bad decisions or had bad luck or whatever you, people want to identify that. They are homeless because they have been excommunicated and driven out of the public arena. Do you see that? Well, how many of you live in this? Well, let's see. You live in a desert? Oh, how about in the mountains? I'm not, I'm not talking about a log cabin now. I'm talking about homeless, living in a desert, homeless, living in a mountain, mountainous region, homeless. I'm talking about in a cave, homeless. I'm talking about living in a hole in the ground, homeless. Not because you think you want better conditions and you build a, th dig a hole in, in a... <coughs> These are the only conditions... Now, I'm going to tell you why I think he did this. I'm going to tell you why I think he did this. Because this describes, when, if you know anything about Jew, the latter days of Jewish history, by that I mean prior to the coming of Christ. If you look at that last period prior to Christ coming into the world, you're going to run into a Maccabean period. The Maccabean period. If you know anything about the Maccabean period, this is what you got. It was out of this period that they were trying to explain the horror that was going on against, against the pivot of God, that they, they had a title, they took a title out of the book of Daniel called the Abomination of Desolation and attached it to this period. Because what they saw the rulers doing to the, to the pivot of God was equal to the Antichrist in the tribulation, the abomination of desolation. I wrote that down in your paper. That's why I think you have that. I think they covered, this writer covered that period in that statement. That's what I think. And it'd be well worth your read sometime to take a look at that, that Maccabean period. Well, that's what I think he did. Because, listen, he's not talking about the fifth cycle of discipline by Rome because the book of Hebrews is written before it. So that's not what he's talking about. No, no, no. He's talking about something that actually happened in the history of the Jewish people prior 
You know why this is where it's at? Prior to the second coming of Christ, because verse 39 and 40 deals with the coming of Christ and the development of the church. That's why he put it where he put it. This guy's writing smart. Now, I know, I know the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and all that. This is really being written wise. This is smart writing. This is really good. In a capsule, I mean, you got one little chapter and he loads it, boy. He loads it up. And he says, look, I hope I, I think as a teacher what he says, I hope I teach you to go and read some of this stuff because there's a lot of history lost right here. I'm just hitting the highlights. I think that. Point number two. The Jewish period of Hebrews 11, 23 through 38 in, your, in the study of Hebrews 11 was under intense suffering of the angelic conflict. And I'm going to tell you why. It was because the amount of messianic prophecies being taught concerning the coming of Christ into the world. Do you know what that this he, he gives a few lists of the king of the judges and he goes right to the prophets. He skips the kings. I mean, he, he's not really interested in that period. He jumps right to the prophets because it was during this period they started writing heavy on the coming of Christ. The heavy, 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 heavy. Isaiah, Ezekiel, I mean, it's heavy, heavy, heavy. It's all heavy. The period of the prophets, it's going to grab the uh, whole last section of your Old Testament Bible. Right? You know, Amos, Amos and Andy in the group. He's going to grab that whole group of guys. It's, it's phenomenal. And beside that, they, they, they're called the minor ones. I don't know what that is. They worked in a coal mine, I guess. They're called the minor ones. And you got the major prophets. Listen, all of these guys, they're, they're blowing. They're, they're storming. And guess who doesn't like this idea? Hmm? Guess who doesn't like this idea? And so the devil, and so he heats it up. He heats it up. It's called the angelic conflict. When you understand this period of Jewish history, you will understand it. And what was, what was this message going out? Christ is coming. And listen, they were looking for the eminence coming of Christ in the first coming. It was eminent. They all believed he would come in their lifetime, just like we believe about the second coming. We believe he's going to come in our lifetime. We believe in the eminence of his return. They looked for the eminence of his coming. Everybody was, everybody was, they wanted to be on their best knowing that Christ was coming just like we are. We don't want to be caught with our pants down or ashamed. The writers call it ashamed. John the Baptist. Hello, John. John shows up. Between the last prophets preaching their hearts out, you've got this inner biblical period of 400 years. And everybody's thinking, well, he's probably not coming now. No more prophets. Nobody's talking. Apparently, apparently that, and boy, the devil loves that kind of talk. And then John shows up. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. John shows up. John the Baptist shows up on fire for God. They haven't heard anything like, there's been 400 years, nobody's had a preacher with fire and brimstone in his belly. For 400 years in Israel, everybody talks out of the side of their mouth and it makes no sense. Along comes John with fire in his belly. And everybody sets up and listens. The hat, listen, when John preached, you went away glad or mad? When Jesus taught, you either went away glad or mad? It's the way it ought to be. You don't, you don't straddle the fence. Tell it like it is. When you watch the book of Acts play out the early church in Acts 17, 6, in the city of Athens, the city of all the gods they could find in the world and identify them, 
boy, you talk about middle of the road. They got upset with Paul and Barnabas because everywhere they went, they were turning the world upside down, King James. I love that. What they were doing is turn it right side up. But when you're upside down and have lived that way, you don't know what right side up is. Survived. And are fired up because of John the Baptist, who has preached the coming of Christ. The coming of Christ. I love Simeon. He was one of these old covenant believers looking for the consolation of Israel out of Luke 2, 25 through 32. He is well worth your read. I love this old man. He had the privilege of holding the baby Jesus in the temple. <coughs> and all he could do was praise God. All he could do was hold that baby and praise God because he was holding the Son of God as an infant in his arms and knew it. Don't you know it was hard to get that baby back to the mama? He's holding that baby in, in service and praising God. All he's doing is praising God, listen, for allowing him to see the Lord's Christ before he died. You know how many generations and generations of generations of his people who passed the baton of faith in Jesus Christ down the pike to get to him over 400 years. And he actually gets to see the birth, the coming of the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He's holding him in his arms as a baby. I mean, it's, I don't know if you've held a baby in your arms recently. I have. And that's an amazing thing when you just see the extension of your heritage. But to hold the Son of God, the Christ we've looked for since Abraham, and beyond to actually hold them in your arm you can't do anything but praise God you'd like to give a little speech you've wondered about this day you've held this day in your heart for so long you always wondered if that day come how would it be man that day is coming I'm holding him right there in my arms and all they can do is praise God isn't that wonderful what more could you do? Just thank God, thank God, thank God. Thank you, God. Let me count his toes. Mm, thank you, God. Let me count his face. Thank you, God. I'll tell you who gives newborn babies inspections. Mama and grandmamas. They check that baby over pretty good. Oh, I'll change his diaper. In a good life. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got everything. Uh, maybe not everybody does it. They do it at my house. What they do with newborn babes. Listen to this. Look how the writer opened the book of Hebrews. See, we forget that by the time we get to Hebrews 11. <laughs> we forgot what the book was written about. Listen to what he says. Oh, boy, listen to this. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Do you see why he, what he's doing in Hebrews 11? Oh, yeah. In these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Twice he used 
our, our word hoss, the word whom, who or whom, whom. Now here's what you're going to miss. How many times God speak? Huh? Well, let me ask you this. The first time he spoke, how long ago was that? Long ago. I, all I'm doing is reading the text, people. <laughs> this is not a gate question. I'm just asking you to read the Bible. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, right? Now, please, you put your hat back on. You took it off, were you getting hot? Put your hat back on. God spoke how long ago? Long ago, and he points a point to, to, to it. What, where did he point to? The prophets. God after, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways. Long ago days... <laughs> Oh, you make it really tough for me. You make it tough for me. Because I don't think you're understanding the dynamics of what we're about to say. In these what? Last days. You know how we know we're in the last days? Because the Messiah has come completed his mission, and went back to the Father to come again. That's how we know we're in the last days. We have this Old Testament, Dale, the prophetic message of Christ. Right? right. Now we've got this, that's called the old, old Covenant or Old Testament. Now we got the New Covenant and New Testament that's based on the coming of Christ, and the return of Christ. It's all based on the coming of Christ. First coming and second coming. Separated by the church age. And God speaks again. And God speaks again. Are you not hearing that? And God speaks again. In the last days, God speaks again. How does he do it? Through his son. Please, when you read the Bible, do it under the ministry of the Spirit. You will get so much more from it. You will get so much more from it. In these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. Look how he spoke before. In the prophets. Look how he speaks today. In his son. Do you see that? In his son. In the prophets. Now he speaks in his son. The difference is the prophetic Christ to the historical Christ. God has spoken in many portions in many ways again. And we're engaged in it. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are engaged in the last grace message from God to the world, the great last message in the last days of the world, the last great message from God is that I sent my son to you that you might be saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It'd be a gift from God. And when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you will get saved. And you will become a child of God, and you have that message for other people that need to hear it from you. They hear all kinds of messages from your life. It's time that your life told them some truth. I mean, what is God doing in your life? 
He's got to be doing something. He's got to be stirring the water somewhere. And you need to be aware of it. For God has spoken through his son to you. You need to know that. In these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom all, uh, also he made the world. Made the world. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. We call that creation. You could call it planet Earth. You could call it a lot of things if you wanted to. He was foreknown. You know, you know where that was? Eternal Life Conference. He was foreknown before the world, before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times. Appeared in these last times. For what reason? Look at this on your paper. For you. For you. Not just for you, but for your sake. Look at that. He has appeared in this time for the sake of you. Not just for you, but for your sake. Your well-being. You go to everybody but God. God is usually the last person that you discuss anything with. It ought to be the first. You ought to pay attention to his Bible because that's his book. That's a book. That's your roadmap in life. Listen to this. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake, for the sake of you, through whom, through who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, where is your faith and hope? It should be in God. It should be in God every day in every circumstance of your life if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It's through being a believer in Jesus Christ that you have the hope and faith that you are in God's care. My, my, my. The last revelation that God gave is the greatest of all the revelations, the fulfillment of the prophetic, the coming of Christ into the world. And why did he come? Paul said he came to save sinners of whom I'm the chief. Stop being a sinner, right? You're a saint. Why are you still, why are you still living that way? Where's your faith? Where's your hope? Where's it supposed to be? It's supposed to be in God. You got it in every place but God. So that, so that your faith, so that your hope are in God. Now, let me close. When I first read the open parenthetical clause, men of whom the world was not worthy, it seems strange to me in light of the passages like John 3, 16. That seems strange to me. I went, well, I'm not getting it. Father, I need to have that explained to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. How, how can that be unworthy? It seemed to me, it seemed to me that was why God sent his son, in order to be the savior of the unworthy of the world. Like in John 4, 42, with the woman at the well and then the city of Sychar. I was kind of stunned at that. I, 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 something I don't, I just don't get. I mean, I'm so thankful you saved me. I was unworthy of my salvation, Father. I'm so thankful you, you rescued me. I thought about Paul's statement in 1 Timothy 
is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I, I went. I thought about my ambassadorship responsibilities. Like in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are the ambassadors of Christ. And then I thought, maybe it is not that they are unworthy to be saved, but chose to be unworthy by rejecting God's grace salvation. And a light bulb went off. Because I remembered Acts 13, 46, when I was studying Paul's three missionary trips. I remembered on his first trip that Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, the Jews, since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And I went, cha-ching. That's it. And for me, Scripture always verifies it. And for me, that was it. For Christ also died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Or 1 John 2, 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. I think that was in the heart of the writer of the book of Hebrews.